Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to call to order our July 7th, 2021 meeting of the Carroll County Planning and Zoning Commission. Can we please establish a quorum? Hi. Hi, Laura. Hi. Here. <laughs> Mr. Canelli. Here. Mr. Wathers. Ms. Kirchner. Here. Mr. Lester. Here. Mr. Gosnell. Commissioner Wamp. Secretary Eisenberg. Here. Ms. Chair, please let the record reflect that four members are present and we do have a quorum. Thank you. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're on now to the review and approval of agenda. I take it we have some edits to our agenda? Um, my agenda does not say edits, but I believe, Evlar, can you just tell me what the edits were? I must have an updated version. No, I was just saying, based upon us leaving at seven, you said you would be advised. Uh, no, 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 the agenda's still fine. So we are, no, the agenda's fine. So, nope. Okay. All right. Can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve the agenda. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Moving on to our administrative report, Secretary Eisenberg. Uh, just one quick housekeeping issue, um, and obviously we're going to continue to do this. I think um, Laura will send out prior to meeting. So again, thank you all for being here. Let me start with that. What we're going to do prior to each meeting is ask everyone just to con confirm the day before their attendance. So there's been some miscommunications, and so we just want to make sure that we know who will be at that meeting. Um, so we're not trying to hound you if we keep reaching out. Um, but especially until we have a full planning commission again, um, and hopefully we will have a new member start in July. Um, from here on out, the practice will be <clears throat> to email you like 24 hours ahead of time, just as a reminder and to let us know yes or no. Typically we say less if you're not going to be there, but we're going to want a yes or no if you can't be there. Um, and if there's a time constraint, just let us know that as well. We're trying to do our best too to have time with each item that's coming before you so we know how to plan it out. Um, as we move, uh, continue with these virtual um, meetings uh, on Wednesday, I think a hard stop for the most part at 8 p.m. list is really something we're struggling with. I really wanna keep these to two hours or less. I think it's just better for everyone. Um, the viewing audience doesn't have that ability and it's hard for people to, I mean, two hours of your evenings a lot when you're giving up like basically a whole half a day once a month as well. Um, and these are just our work sessions where we're just trying to have discussions and it's a little more informal anyway. So I think we can definitely adhere to more of a flexible time frame. Um, it's a little bit harder for our business meetings because we do a business. That's the whole point of that meeting is to get the business of the day done so Carroll County can keep moving forward with the various projects that need to come before you, the planning commission. Um, so that's all I have to share with you regarding that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Eight o'clock. Um, not much gets accomplished after eight o'clock. <laughs> so with that, we'll move on to item number six, our Freedom Sanitary Su Sewer Survey, the briefing. I take it of the results, hopefully. Yes, so um, I do. So as you recall, we did a specific to the Freedom area a sanitary sewer survey. And the purpose of this survey was to see um, who in the freedom community that is not currently on the county sewer service that has a small lot, meaning two acres or less, built prior to 1990. Um, and that is within the sewer envelope, meaning that there is an ability to connect in the future um, would be interested if it ever became available to connect to the system. So we picked the group 
prior to sending them the mail and I will share the map with you of the area that we selected and I have a little presentation to go through about the results um, to see who would be interested and also if there were any problems that we weren't aware of um, just to start that ball rolling. The next step after sanitary sewer survey, it, um, I'm sorry, after the Freedom Sanitary Sewer Survey, if we wanted to move to that next level, would then be doing a more in-depth study, working with the health department and a private consultant to do um, a, a more in-depth sanitary sewer briefing where they actually go door to door. Um, they actually check systems to see if there seems to be any signs of failures things like that. Um, I will tell you this was not spurred on by any health department issues. This was not spurred on by complaints of people that have failing systems. Um, this was something that was initiated by staff, but at the behest of the Freedom District Community Association, the FDCA. So that's how this project moved forward. So Control, if I could just share my screen um, and I'll just run through what's already currently on our website. Um, the survey ran from May 1 to June 1. We compiled the results and they, they are posted now. So we will be giving the Board of County Commissioners a briefing next Thursday at their open session on July 15th. And um, at that point in time, if they feel that they want to move forward, we'll discuss it at that time. So control room, if I could share my screen, please. Control room, I don't know if you can hear me. Can I share my screen, please? Okay, so this is currently on our website and this can be found under our water and sewer planning portion of our website under the Freedom Interest Survey. And we just have a link here that says click here to scroll through the survey analysis. And so here is the survey analysis. Can you all see that? I'm gonna make it big for you all. All right. So we had sent out approximately 860 surveys to targeted houses within the Freedom area. Um, from our uh, month of having this open, and don't pay attention to the date. The date is um, misleading. It's a free generation by um, SurveyMonkey. That's when I originally did the original stuff. That's when I created the survey was April 12th. So that's what that is, not when the results came in or this presentation was created. But that's SurveyMonkey. So we had 377 total responses come in out of the 860 or so that were sent out. And you can see this map here, the stars, and I purposely kind of um, made it a little hard to see exact locations. So I don't want to, this was not meant to be a public document. So you can see what someone on one main street, what their responses were. This is really just to give you an idea of who responded and where they are. So it's going to be a series of questions with some maps um, of the supporting data. So I purposely obscured things so you couldn't pinpoint exact locations. But as you can see, pretty decent distribution from all of the various areas that, that were selected within the freedom community. So all of the the dots, it's a fairly even distribution, not one particular area of, of the survey response area outweighed another area. So the first question that we asked was part of the survey is, is this your primary residence? Um, and the reason we did that was because our experience and prior um, sanitary sewer surveys that we have done, um, a, a lot of times there were a lot of renters and that has been challenging to, to move forward with anything more in depth. When we did this in Finksburg several years ago, renters actually tended to be more hesitant um, in completing surveys and more hesitant in having the health department or other officials even come to the site and, and, and open the door to even speak to anyone because they were afraid they were getting their landlord in trouble. That seemed to be really resigned. So that's another reason. So if we move to this next step, we know that we're working um, with owners uh, to make sure that, that 
that's the demographic that we're dealing with. Cynthia, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just asking on the previous slide, the outlined area, that's our designated growth area, correct? Not the, pri or is that the priority funding area? That is our entire designated growth area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And again, kind of picking up on, um, is this your primary residence and do you rent to your property? I mean, you, they should correlate like this. You'd expect if most of the people are, it's their primary residence, then you would expect not a lot of rentals. So again, that was to make sure that we knew if we go to the next level, that we will be dealing with owners who actually can be decision makers um, if anything moves forward with the property. Um, it was also important to know, because this would be part of a future survey again, how many people occupy the dwelling. And most of these tend to be, you know, one to two person households, which is over 50% of the respondents. Um, very few, like 30, a little more than 30% were three to four, and few, like 10%, were actually have four or more people occupying that. And that's good to know, too, because you can kind of maybe see how heavily used their septic system is. The only one or two people on it, it's not as obvious the heavy usage as a four person household between showers, bathroom usage, laundry, all the things that come with having a home and living in a home. Um, this map just kind of illustrates the distribution of household size. And for the most part, it's pretty evenly distributed um, where everyone is living. There's not one area that particularly speaks out to having mostly larger families versus smaller families. It's pretty well throughout the whole area, hom homogeneous in the distribution of one, one to two, three to four, and greater than four occupant housing. Um, has the septic system been replaced? And that was important to know too, because if you've replaced your septic system, you may be less likely to want to go on sewer because everything's working well and you don't need a new sewer system or you don't have to be hooked up, you don't need a new septic system. You're, you're working fine and plus you just made a big investment um, at some point in your ownership of replacing that septic system. Um, so, a little more than 20% have replaced them. So actually that was kind of surprising. I would have thought more people would have um, because they are smaller lots. Um, but the majority, more than 50% of the respondents have not replaced their system. And again, not one particular area really spoke out to having um, replaced or not, not replaced. It's kind of, again, if you can see from that, pretty evenly distributed um, with where people are. I mean, I could have taken this one step further and done like a spatial ana analysis using like a grid pattern and, you know, did some calculations, but it just seemed very evenly distributed. And if we want to move to that next level of analysis, we can do that. But again, not one area really stood out. Um, and then when did you replace your system? If someone replaced it more than 20 years ago, then they may be due again. Um, because septic systems do have a finite life expectancy. The majority of the ones that were replaced, as you can see from this, that answered the question. So this is interesting. This is one of the questions because not everyone had a replacement. So out of this small percentage here of the yes, so out of the 30, uh, less than 30% of those that said yes, then this is that 30%, that 272, so 105 people answered it, 272 people skipped it. So that's at 30%. So out of that, 30% of those have systems over 20 years old. Um, but for the most part, you know, five to 10 seems to be about where people are. So I would say that, you know, close to the other half, um, replace them within the last five to 10 years, which seems reasonable. Um, and have you had any septic problems? So 30% um, of the people said yes, um, and 70% obviously of the people said no, they've never had problems. Um, so again, the majority of the area has not had any really outstanding problems. And you would assume that 30% that said yes were also the ones that replaced them at some point in time. Um, and here's a distribution of the problems. I mean, again, you, you could say that maybe a little bit up where the lots are much smaller, these 
near Eldersburg Elementary behind Freedom Elementary tend to be more of the smaller lot sizes, closer to that half acre. They may be some of the ones that may have had more issues um, in the past. So, but no area has been brought up to us by homeowners saying, look, we're all having issues and we can't replace our system or the health department coming at us saying, look, you have a real problem in this area that we've been alerted to. So again, no, no real systemic issues have come up or not actually even no private issues of people calling us have come up. Um, but I find this one very interesting. So again, given everyone that we heard back from, um, the majority of the people would be interested in connecting. Uh, so 70% of that 375, so you would say well over 200 people would be interested in connecting if it was available to them. Um, and again, you can see the yeses, so kind of on Gaither Road seems to be where a lot of the yeses and up by Freedom Elementary seems to be where the majority of the yeses um, tend to be. Further down on Gaither Road toward the county line tended to be a lot of no's and areas that seem to be a little more of the outliers um, would not want to connect and they're actually on the edge of the envelope anyway. So um, totally, you know, that, that, you know, kind of a little insightful. Um, and then the most common reasons why people didn't want to connect and that 117 people out of that 372 wrote comments um, and this was a resounding theme. Um, these four came up over and over again. There was nothing else like that was kind of unique that came up that stuck out. But um, the cost to connect to the county sewer system, um, and they were using it as a blanketed term, but we do charge area connection charges. Um, and typically, if the county were to bring a sewer line, it's the main line. You, the homeowner, would be responsible for getting it from your home to that main and whatever that cost would be, um, somewhere between five and 10,000, I'd imagine, depending on how long the run is. Um, and then our area connection charges. Um, the cost of quarterly bills, so just getting that bill. Um, people didn't wanna add to a monthly uh, bill that they have to pay. A lot of the people um, stated that they were either on the fixed income because they were senior citizens or were lower income anyway, and that would be just an additional burden, an additional cost they didn't want to, have to take on. Or they they have a reliable septic system, so they have never had issues, or they've replaced their septic system, so they've already put in that big expense that would be almost the equivalent of hooking into the county sewer. So they have a good system, they don't have to pay a quarterly bill. This would change the dynamic if they had to do that. Um, so those are all the slides that I have for you. Are there any questions? And um, I can stop sharing my screen unless there's a slide you want me to go back to. Linda, first of all, thank you for doing this. I, I appreciate it. I, I think this is, this is you know, information's good. Um, statistically, what, in, in terms of the number of people in the Freedom District that, that potentially would want would have access to sewer. Do we consider 860 to be, is that about the right number of the total people that in the area that would be, maybe have access? You mean to, that are in the sewer envelope that aren't connected that want to hook up? Yes, that, that might want to hook up. The ones that are in that, what we call long range. Like right. The, yeah, the developed long range, yes. That would be okay. the majority of those. There might be some outliers, but for the most part. Sure, and 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 do we consider, I, I feel like, forgive me, from a statistics standpoint, I have no clue, I, I don't remember, where, where do we have to get to where we can say with confidence as a planning commission, planning and zoning commission, that we think we understand what the sentiment is? I mean, 377 out of 860 sounds pretty good to me. Is that... Do you, do you think that this is a good sample? I mean, that's really, I, I, I can't say. I mean, I'm not a statistician, so I can't I can't go by like the sample size. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I can't tell you definitively. I think from what we sent out, the responses we got seemed positive in favor. Okay, all right. Thank you, very interesting. 
All right. So we'll be taking this to the commissioners next week um, and they'll tell us how they want to move forward. So if we do move forward, we'll let you know. Good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Now we'll move on to item number seven, which is our discussion of the outstanding issues for the residential tax. Thank you. Um, could I get the ability to share my screen? Thank you. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes? Mary, do it in presentation form, it makes the screen bigger. Sure. Thank you. Better? Okay. Um, so as um, Ms. Cheatwood said, we are here today to try to start wrapping up some of the outstanding issues. As you'll recall, over the past five months, you have had, I believe, seven work sessions as well as a public engagement session, and we have gone page by page through, through the code. Um, uh, several issues have been brought up by the um, citizens and also other commenters, and some of these also you have expressed um, a wish to revisit. So just very briefly, the issues that we've identified are private kennels, the storage containers used as sheds, private schools that was brought up by um, Gerstel Academy, age-restricted housing, and there were a number of comments on both sides regarding our proposal of age-restricted housing. Cluster subdivision has attracted a lot of comment and attention as well as accessory dwelling units, again, on both sides of accessory dwelling units. So today, I think we're just going to try to get through probably the, the first three are the ones that are we are ready to discuss today. The others may require more research and um, we are looking into some of the comments that we've received so that we have a good response to them. So the first one is private kennels. And just as a reminder, they're currently defined as in conjunction with the residents, the keeping of personal pets of more than three dogs which have permanent canine teeth. Um, there's no upper limit included in the definition. Private kennels are permitted as an accessory use in any zoning district upon approval by the zoning administrator followed by a public hear or following a public hearing. The staff proposal is to remove the regulation of private kennels from the zoning code since it is an animal control issue. This was one of the first things we talked about in March. Um, the Planning Commission discussed the staff proposal and expressed concerns about removing the regulation entire entirely. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jay to lead this discussion. Good evening, everybody. Um, like I say, private kennels, I mean, regulate the number of dogs on a property. Right now, you're allowed to have a maximum three. If you want more, you have to have approval for a private kennel. But what this really comes down to is this is an animal control issue. Um, why does zoning care how many animals dogs, I should say, on your property. Um, we don't worry about I mean, how many cats or any other pets. Um, it's just dogs. And like I say, a lot of the issues that we have with the private kennels, which come down to care or noise, are things that are covered by the Animal Control Ordinance, which is enforced by the Humane Society. Um, so there's really, as far as I can see, no reason for us to have, give approval for someone to have four dogs or as many as they, they feel they can handle. If it gets to a point where the dogs are being treated badly or, or being kept in unsafe conditions, there's nothing I can do about it. That would be an animal control issue. And that's basically what private kennels are. They're they're in animal control. How many animals should this person be taking care of? Are they being treated well? Are they making too much noise? 
That's all covered in the animal control ordinance. The only thing I'm saying is, yeah, you can have more than three dogs. Um, we get a lot of requests for hearings for this. Um, there are a lot of people out there that um, do uh, dog rescues and might have two pets of their own and might have two or three dogs that they're rescuing for people or, or keeping for people. It just makes no sense to have private kennels in our ordinance and us being involved in that process. It's strictly a animal control issue. Um, I don't know what else really to say about it. I mean, uh, it costs people money to apply for approval for a private kennel. It's 150 bucks for a hearing. Um, and all I'm saying to them is, okay, I, yeah, you could have more than three dogs. Um, anything else involved in it is, up, like I say, is up to animal control. So I see, and I think a lot of us other people on staff think, there's no real reason for us to be involved in that issue. So, Jay, I guess the one thing, um, I'm, I mean, and, and I know it was Dan who was adamantly opposed, but so my neighbor was brought before you for having more than three dogs and for it to get a private cut, and you did deny that from to him. And based um, upon what, did they say why I denied it? Yes, it's it's uh, of course your your letter described it quite quite um, and all, most of the stuff that was in the letter I had no idea about that the dogs had gotten loose and had bitten and animal control was aware of the dogs. However, nothing had been done about them until you denied the private kennel. Correct. So I guess so. What you're saying. I, I understand what you're saying where maybe it, this shouldn't be in there, but to me, nothing, nothing happened until it came before you. Well, uh, I think there are things that happened. I just don't think things were pursued or because the, uh, if I remember correctly, there was a report taken by animal control about the, the, um, the biting incident. Um, I don't have, like I say, I don't, interpret or enforce or anything in that law at all so i have no reason i have nothing to think about why they didn't take any further with that right um i think if if this is the property i'm thinking of uh, there was more than just one thing because i turned it down i mean the they weren't being confined to the property they were getting loose mm -hmm. uh, once again that's still that's that's an animal control issue. You know, animal control needs to step up to the plate and enforce their ordinance. If they have enforced their ordinance, then there wouldn't have been this issue of having a private kennel there. Right. Because I guess they would have. I mean, I have no, I have no authority to enforce anything with dogs, except right. that you can have so many. And even with the, the case that you're referring to, as far as I'm concerned, he can still have three of the dogs. And it could be, for all I know, the three dogs that are the most vicious. I don't know. I don't have any way of investigating it or enforcing anything about those dogs. It's I'm just saying, yeah, you can have three or four. Um, and I think, though, once it came to you, though, it all of the neighboring neighbors and everybody in the area received notification, too. Correct. So, like I said, um, whatever's happened with animal control, I didn't receive any notification of what what that they had and, been and reported. Like, and that, and that, I won't say when a police officer takes a police report, they don't not notify the neighbors that they've taken a police report. Mm -hmm. or an incident that's happened at somebody's house. Mm -hmm. That's a normal law enforcement procedure, I guess. They don't go out and tell everybody, hey, we had, you know, something happened at this house. Um, and it's the same way with animal control. They're only dealing with the people who have the problem. They're not required to notify anybody else. Um, but in this case, the neighborhood did know about it because Apparently, the neighbors talk to each other in your neighborhood, which is a good thing. Um, and they all knew about it. 
but like I say, there's nothing that really says that animal control has to notify you about it. Yeah. But I, I do see that as one advantage of keeping this in the text in that if it's brought up and then they're, they're forced to apply for the private kennel, then notification does go out to the community. I mean, I think that's one thing we've heard from a lot of community members is they want to be kept informed or at least, I mean, they, they don't know everything. So this was one instance where I, I understand where you're coming from, Jay, but I think this gave more notification and, and open to the community of what's going on. Well, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you on that. I mean, like I say, we do notify people because of the hearing request. That's required in, in my procedure. Um, but believe it or not, in most of those hearings, when we notify people that there's going to be a hearing about a dog kennel, there are a lot of people, neighbors that don't show up and just don't care. I mean, it does, in this case, I, it, I think it brought them together more because there was a biting incident involved in it but if you were having other troubles with the dogs i mean some people just don't care i mean it's it's, it's up to you i mean it's I'll, i'm going to be doing whatever you know the county commissioners put in the code that's and i'm fine with it doing that but like i say this is really an animal control issue that they're the ones who have the authority to take a dog away from somebody, to confine a dog, um, things of that nature that in reality should have been taken care taken in this case. Um, it, it's something that they need to really start stepping up and doing is, is enforcing the laws. I mean, it's, it's what I do. And you know, there are a lot of laws in here that I don't like to enforce a lot of laws that I don't even agree with, but I still enforce it. And it's, that's, it's their responsibility. I mean, it's not mine to, to rid the planet of extra dogs. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to put something where it belongs to be in control of. Does anybody else have any questions? I do. Well, not a question so much, um, but I think that what happens is when you don't have a hearing, the citizens or the neighbors don't really get a chance to say, you know, so-and-so's dog ran crazy and it's been all around the neighborhood, regardless of whether they bite somebody. Um, I just think it takes away that well, knowledge of what's going on there. Well, I understand that, but, but then again, like I say, if they're complaining to me or, or raising this concern during a hearing, I, I don't, I can't do anything about it. All I'm going to say is yes, you can have more than three dogs or no. And there's no limit. I mean, you could have 20 dogs on your property if you ask for it. I mean, that, generally we try to limit it to 10. That's what our policy has been. But legally you could ask for as many as you want as pets. Now are all those dogs going to be pets? I, I don't think so. But like I say, I, I don't have any way to enforce anything. And it takes time, effort, and money to do something. And you could have two dogs. I mean, you could have one dog that gets out a lot and runs around a lot and, you know, scares people. No, it doesn't have to be, you know, a lot of dogs to do that. And I can't do anything about that one dog. It's That's just as bad as having to try to take care of four or five dogs. But the people who can take care of that, our animal control and that's where it's in their ordinance about barking noise the care of them um, the conditions that they're being kept in that's all in their ordinance and they can enforce it now whether they want to enforce it or not that's entirely up to them but there's nothing i can do they call me constantly saying well someone has three dogs you know they you know 
or say, well, they got five dogs and they can only have three, you know, we want you to go and make them get rid of the dogs. Well, the way to get rid of the dogs legally through the ordinance, I'm not telling them, I'm just telling them he has to get rid of them. Animal control is the one that has the authority to go in and take them or, or enforce whatever laws that apply at that time. So it's something that we do a lot of that, you know, I feel, and I feel very strongly about it, believe it or not, is something that they should be doing, not zoning. It takes up time, effort. I mean, I don't have a very large staff and we are, we get calls quite a bit about too many dogs on a property. Jay, do you feel that maybe one reason why they don't enforce it so much is because they know they can throw it back on our zoning code? Well, all they're throwing back on me is how many dogs they can have. The problem right. still persists. Even if I say get rid of the fourth dog, you got three. The problem is still going to could still be there. And that right. it's telling somebody how many dogs you can have is not really solving any problem. It's, it's the dogs themselves that may be the, it could be the, like I said, the owner could be a big part of it, but it's the dog's behavior and stuff that are the problem. And that's nothing I can do about that. Absolutely nothing. I'd say, get rid of the fourth dog. And then you could still be having a major problem. And I can't even tell them what dog to get rid of. If there is one dog that is particularly vicious, I can't say, well, you got to get rid of this dog. You know, I just have to say, Get rid of one of them. I don't care which one, but get rid of it. So the problem can still persist. And only way anything that can be done to enforce anything is through animal control. So I don't know if any of the other members have any other. I know how Janice feels. Pete, Gene, I don't know if you guys have any. Well, I have a question. You know, this whole conversation was, was centered around dogs. Uh, and I, I understand where Jay's coming from. I understand the situation, but what if there's, let's say somebody has four dogs and then he has a bunch of, I'll say, other animals, such as raccoons, a pet pig, chickens? I have no control over those other animals. The only animals I can say to get rid of are the dogs. Okay, so that was, that, that was the basis of my question. So the, the amount of other animals has nothing to do with the count of the dogs. Right, on, and we had a recent, well, not real recent, I guess this is about four years ago, we had a case involved with, there was a couple over towards Hampstead. They were keeping 200 different birds in their house. And it was creating a huge health problem in their house. I mean, it, it, it was, and it bothering the neighbors. Um, the birds were outside a lot in their cages and driving the neighbors nuts. But I couldn't tell them to get rid of the birds. I had to go after them for having what's called an air AVR, which is the keeping of birds. It's a business is what they were doing. They were running a business. I went after them for running a business, not because they had 200 birds. Now they did eventually move the birds from the house to another location and they do run it as a business at that other location. So I wasn't, I didn't care about the birds. It was the business. Uh, the same way with cats. You could have 200 cats on your property and there's not a thing I could do about it. Uh, raccoons, I mean, they're not usually considered a domestic pet, um, but animals that are domestic pets, like I say, the only ones I have any kind of control over are dogs. And like I say, if, if, and cats and, and other animals, like you say, they can cause just as much problem as dogs, but I can't do anything about them. You know, Jay, I, I'm sitting here listening to you, and, and I was pretty vocal with Dan on this, too. Uh, and I'll say, the fact that you feel so strongly about this gives me cause for pause. You know, and I don't mean a pun by that. Um, uh, <laughs> but but at the same time, I, I happen to agree with with Cynthia's statement that having a, a layer here where, where it basically says, this is kind of what our, our community's expectations are in terms of, of, you know, if, if you have more than three, you, you need to, you need to 
go through some sort of process. Now, I, again, I'm up for, I'm open to taking this out of, uh, out of, out of here, but I'd love to see or know what the response would be for the Humane Society or whoever the animal control, you know, how, how are they going to step up and what sort of process can they implement to maybe supplement what we're doing away with this I, and I, that may not be within our purview and so we probably need to move on because i, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time but I, I i'm i'm inclined to do what you're asking us to do but i also want to make sure that the people that are supposed to, to 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 carry the torch here because you can't in terms of enforcement i, I would like to make sure that our communities have some sort of reasonable expectation Oh, and I understand that. I do. I, I truly do. Um, and one, one other thing, I mean, you can have up to three dogs with canine teeth. You can have as many puppies as you want. So if, if, if you know, you could have 20 puppies at a place and there'd be a dog breeder running a business. Now, I'll go after them for running a business if, if that's possible. But you could have, you may not have any three any adult dogs you may have just all puppies and there's not a thing i can do about it i so said that's where animal control to... regulations step in at so no decisions need to be made tonight obviously and this body is just a recommending body so you know again this is going before the board of county commissioners as well so i think a good place would be you know we can come back to this at another time when more members are present and come to a recommendation decision. That's what we're gonna do for all of these. So again, no decisions need to be made tonight. When we package this up, we will have final recommended decisions by this body to move forward with. Agreed. Um, but I think the discussion we're having, thanks Jay for all that. I mean, I understand your frustration and and Peter, I think you said exactly what I was thinking. I, I guess it gives at least the community in the neighborhood some kind of known something, but it seems limited and it, it sounds like it's putting a lot of time and effort on our zoning administrator that could be spent elsewhere. I think we're ready to move to the next one. Okay, so I will put this on the list of items that you'll take a vote on at the next meeting or possibly um, the meeting following that. Um, I mean, that should be with all of them. I think, again, no vote. But okay. we'll go back and vote if that's how you all want to handle it. We'll go back and have final recommendations for each item. Okay, the next issue that you had requested be brought back to you is regarding storage containers. Um, and actually, this is incorrect, not as a temporary use, but as a permanent accessory use. Um, the current code does not specifically address the portable storage containers as permanent um, structures. There's a new section proposed that says that a self-contained portable storage container that is used as a shed is considered a permanent structure and must be located wholly within the rear yard. There was concern when this, it was actually discussed at two different meetings and there was concern regarding the inclusion of this type of structure as a permanent accessory use, particularly without a size limitation. So again, I'm gonna turn this over to Jay to talk about um, maybe a possible size limitation or any other concerns that you have. Yeah, um, like I say, that once again, this is another issue that's becoming um, a, a much larger issue because more and more people are buying sea containers and using them as sheds. Um, they're cheap. You can buy one for $1,000 or less. And they're just as good as, if not better, than any wooden shed you're going to, going to get to put on your property to secure stuff. It is becoming a problem. We've recently had a case you know, where the neighbors don't look like looking at it. Um, I understand that. I particularly wouldn't want to look at a storage container as a shed. I'd rather see something nicer. But then again, also under our code, I could have a junked up car sitting on my property and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's going to look just as bad, if not worse than a sea container. Uh, 
So, I mean, in a way, you know, true, they're, they're not the same, but if you're looking at how things are looked at, they're the same. I mean, they're not pretty. They sometimes can be ugly, but so is a junked up car sitting on your property. What I like to see you do is allow Miss Sheds for as, as a permanent structure. And we can put some requirements on that. We can limit the size of them. I mean, now you can get them usually in 20 foot lengths, 40 foot and 53 foot lengths. Like I say, they only cost a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars to buy a fifty-three foot container. I would like if we allow this to say a maximum of twenty feet and they have to be kept in good repair. Um, they have to be in the rear yard, not a lap, not you know, parked alongside the house or in front of the house, but it totally in the rear, just like a shed has to be. Um, it, it's just something that is the increasing issue with more and more people buying these sea containers. I mean, I think that sounds reasonable at 20 feet. I think that's more than plenty. I mean, that's a pretty big well, structure. Yeah, you know, the containers are usually eight feet wide and then yeah. 20 foot long and, and eight to nine foot tall, depending on what type you get. It's about the same size as a lot of sheds most people buy and drive, have, have delivered to their property, and a guy backs up in a truck and drops it off in the rear yard, and there's an instant shed. A lot of people do that. It's sea container comes to you the same way. Guy in a truck drives up to your property, backs up into your yard, and then he leaves it there. Um, I know we have talked about possibly putting some screening around it or doing something of that nature. Um, I see an issue with that. We don't require sheds to be screened. We don't, I could put a 30 by 40 building in my backyard. It, it's not required to be screened. Um, yeah, like I said, would I like to see one in my backyard? Not particularly. Would I like to see one in my neighbor's yard? Not particularly, but then once again, it's something that is becoming a larger issue all the time. And we just had one issue that we're still working on. Um, someone had a sea container. We told them they had to get rid of it. They went ahead and turned it into a trailer. They put wheels on it that met the, uh, the motor vehicle code. They put lights. They put a trailer um, hook on it. They did everything they needed to do to make it a trailer. And they got it registered in the state of Maine as a licensed trailer. There's not a thing I can do once they do that. It's a licensed vehicle then. And it's still sitting in the same spot. It's still actually sitting up on blocks a little bit. And as long as it's a tagged vehicle, there's nothing I can do. I mean, so there's ways of getting around it, like just about everything else. But I'd rather have some control over it and, and, and try to do it that way and, and have something where we can actually say, yeah, the code says, yes, you can have one, but it has to be no more than 20 feet long. Uh, maybe a limit of only one per property might be another thing to add to it. So if someone doesn't bring in four or five of them, um, and there are people that have four or five sheds on their property. So I could see that happening. So I think there are things we can do to help control it. I just don't think we're going to be able to stop it or like I say, enforce it well, not to have them at all. You know, Jay, I'm, I'm thinking limiting the number and limiting the, the size is probably, a, the, the, both of those things seem reasonable to me. The, the truth of it is like you, I wouldn't want one in my backyard and I really wouldn't want my neighbors to, to have one either. And, 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 you know, I, I don't think our, I, uh, I do, our association wouldn't allow it. So, you know, that that's one thing I think that that again can can maybe save some of the neighborhoods from this sort of thing if if we think they need to be saved at all they can they can save themselves to some degree right 
and, and what you're saying is, is true. There are some homeowners associations that wouldn't allow it. You know, some of them, you have to have a very certain type of shed in your backyard right. according to their rules. Um, but then again, that's an issue that of the neighborhood that belongs to that association to enforce. Um, and it's like I say, if the neighborhood says, hey, no, we don't want them, so you can't have them on your property in our neighborhood, I can't enforce that but the homeowners association can because that's, that's a private regulation. It's not government sponsored. Um, that is one way of controlling them. But then again, some homeowners associations, you have some that are very active and then you have some that aren't active at all and you can do whatever you want and violate the law, their law. So, I mean, it's, if we're going to have to deal with it, I'd rather from my standpoint have some, control or say of what you can have there and try to limit the impact they have on properties. So I agree with what you're saying, um, but I'm curious, when you say good repair, what determines that good repair? So if it has to be in good condition, I'll, do they I have would, to I would say we, we have one section in the code that on commercial properties that they're allowed to have containers. Um, and there's a section in that they have to be maintained and, and kept painted in good repair. Um, basically, I would say, you know, no big holes in them or, you know, rusted out. That's why you would keep it painted to stop it from rusting. Um, that would probably be one of the biggest issues about you know, maintenance and everything going on is keeping them painted so they look nice. So you could have a lot of, yeah, and there's a lot of sheds out there. If you go drive around, there are some beautiful sheds out there, but there and are some, some out there that are ready to fall down. Yeah, I can't do anything about it. It's still, still there. So, like I say, if we have a chance to control some of the things that are happening to it, I think from a county standpoint, I think we'd be better off doing that. Yeah, I, th I think we all agree with you to add that language into the to the text. Okay, so we're adding in that they have to be kept in good repair, one per property and 20 foot maximum in size. Yeah, all three of those things. Yeah, totally wholly within the rear yard. Right, right. Like we already said, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, did you want me to move on to the next one or did you want to wrap it up and continue next time? Janice, do you have time? I mean, if you have to leave, I don't want. You're on mute. You're on mute, Janice. <laughs> well, it's good you couldn't hear what I was saying anyway. Um... I am. I'm good for a short period of time, but um, I'm, yeah, I've got like one? 10 minutes. What's the next one, Mary? We'll see if the next is one is private schools. I can probably get through that fast talking in 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. If I can move my slides. Okay. Um, this was brought to your attention by the um, owner of Gristel Academy, as well as Jack Lyburn. The current code permits private schools um, by right in all the residential districts, and public schools are also permitted by right. It, in fact, it doesn't differentiate between the two. The staff proposal was to allow private schools in all the districts, the four districts, with conditional use approval. We did identify after we received this comment four schools that are currently operating in the county that would become non-conforming uses because they would not have a conditional use approval. They could get a conditional use approval and become conforming, but um, that's it. That's not always what people desire to do. So letters have been received again from Gristel Academy and the director of the Department of Economic Development. Uh, requesting that at least in the R40,000 district, which um, is where that property is, and it is a large property, it's 92 acres, that private schools remain a permitted use. But um, 
they also did point out and request that we go back to the way the code currently is that private schools are not differentiated from um, public schools and the reference should be changed to just permit all schools in all residential districts. So there's kind of two options there. You could do the um, more specific request, if you wish, to just allow um, private schools in the R40,000 without a conditional use, or we could go back to the way the code is currently written that they all be permitted in all the residential districts, or you could leave it as proposed. Does anybody have any questions? Is there any further information you would want me to find on this before you make a decision and take a vote at the next meeting or a further, uh, future meeting? So currently they're allowed by right, correct? So correct. we're changing some, we're changing the code to then make them a non-conforming. But yes, similar, I think we've received comments also from the community too that potentially they should be conditional because without being able to just stick a school in without the community having at least a, a discussion about it. Um, well, another option would be, I mean, we did this on a few other uses with commercial and industrial. You could technically grandfather the existing as of, um, you know, July 1st, 2021, the existing private schools would be considered permitted uses. The use table would actually spell that out and they would not become non-conforming. If, if that was your, if you wanted to protect the existing private schools from getting that status as well as um, change the code so that future ones did have to go through the process of neighborhood input, you could do that as well. Yeah, I, I, you know, Mary, I see this as being very similar to what we face over there at the hospital, obviously a different use, you know, where we've got something going on. It's a, it's an enormous asset and, and no one's really complaining about what's going on there and how it's being done. You know, we're just trying to tighten up our codes so that in the future, you know, things aren't done. And so I think either grandfathering it or, yeah, you know, I don't feel strongly one way or the other. I, I appreciate what we're trying to do here. Um, uh, and I wish I had a, a, a strong, um, you know, feeling about which is best. W w Mary, which, which do you think is the best way to do this so that we, you know, provide Gerstel and the other existing schools with the certainty that they need so that they can operate in the future, but then we're not opening, you know, R40 to, 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 future school development without the community's input? Well, I will say that our, our group staff recommendation was to make it conditional, but we really hadn't done the research on if we were impacting existing institutions. So if you do want to protect the existing institutions from that status, that would be the option would be to have, have two almost separate types of private schools, private schools in existence on July 1st, 2021 and those not in existence. One would be a permitted use, one would be a conditional use. And it's a little unusual, but as I said, we did it with the commercial and industrial when we didn't want to negatively impact existing uses. You wouldn't want to do it throughout the code with every single use, but in, in this case, I think it's been identified and you, you've gotten a pretty good case made to you why Gerstel Academy would not want to become conditional. So, I mean- if you don't, you don't want to really try or, or do is you don't want to put a non-conforming use on them too, because that could affect them financially with banks and, and loan organizations. They see non-conforming on something that can really affect those type of activities. So if you could make them, you know, like Mary said, either, you know, permitted and conditional uses, um, you know, that would be great. I mean, a, when you get down to it, a school is a school, whether it's a small six children Amish schoolhouse or it's someplace like um, Gerstel Academy, they're, they're all schools. And currently, like I say, they're permitted uses. Um, 
you could also take a, a, a size um, for Stell Academies on over 90 acres. If, if you didn't want to specifically grandfather them, you could pick a size that you thought was reasonable to be a permitted use um, that wouldn't negatively impact neighbors. Even in the future, it wouldn't just be grandfathering an existing one. So there's there's a few options if that's the direction you want to go in. Uh, also, one other thing just, just maybe to think about, in our code currently for schools, there are different acreage requirements that you have to meet to have a school on a property. You can't, in an R40 zone, that's usually one acre lots or close to one acre lots. Um, for an elementary school, it takes a minimum five acres. So it's not like you're gonna be putting a, um, a, a large school or anything like that on a one acre lot. I mean, there are lot size requirements. And even for a small school, it's a school. It requires that five acres for a school. Um, it's not going to be put on, you know, a one acre or acre and a half lot for, for a school. It's got to meet those other requirements also. That's a really good point. We do have in the new um, bulk requirements for elementary and middle, it has to be on at least five acres, high school at least 10 acres. And that isn't, um, that doesn't differentiate the public from the private. So you really wouldn't have to worry about it. it. It wouldn't meet those requirements, although it could probably get a variance, Jay. It, really, yeah, it, it, probably, it probably could, but like I say, to get a variance from five acres down to one acre, that's a big variance. And that would probably at least require going before the board instead of coming before me for a variance. Mm -hmm. It would require a full hearing probably. Do you want me to, before the next meeting, almost put together a chart of like four or five options on this one from leaving it the way we've proposed it to leaving it the way the current code is and several options in between? Yeah, and especially so we can get an idea, like, I mean, Gerstel's bigger, but there's three other schools. Uh, I would imagine one is the North Carroll Community School that we have off of 97 that we've seen a couple times. Um, um. I'm not sure that's on residential land. No. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, that might be not. ag. Okay. Yeah. Most okay. of the other ones are on ag. The other, actually, it's a total of four. So the other three are all on properties that are under um, four acres. So. Okay. Yeah. So they're already under, I'm sorry, under five acres. Okay. Yeah, if you could put together the, the, the couple options. Okay. So then at the next meeting, we plan on coming back to these, doing um, some of the more difficult issues, or not more difficult necessarily, but more controversial, which were cluster subdivisions, age-restricted housing, and um, accessory dwelling units was also brought up, and anything else commission members want us to bring to them. Sounds good, thank you. So um, we do have uh, item number eight is our public comment because I do see we have a caller on the line. Can you, Katron, can you unmute that caller and we'll... Okay, <laughs> but I guess it is what it is. Thank you. Uh, caller, uh, we're having a problem unmuting you if you wanted to make a comment. Uh, we will, as we talked about, bring this up at our next meeting. You're more than welcome to call in at that time and make your public comment. So uh, with that, I'll say our next meeting is Tuesday, July 20th. It's a business meeting at nine o'clock in person at the county office building. So with that, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn and I will not be there in two weeks. So see you guys in a little bit. Thank you.